we had uh, we had finished at the very bottom of Chaf Beis Amid Beis. We had talked about a person who thought that he would be able to hold in his urine until after he finished Shmon Esrei, but then realized that he couldn't hold it in and lost control of his bladder while he was davening. So he urinates in the middle of his Shmon Esrei. And then the question is, where does he resume? So one Mandomer had said that he has to start all over again, and the other Mandomer says that he can go back to where he left off. So, Lema Bahaka Miflagi, the last three words of Chaf Beis and Beis, let us suggest the Machlokas is as follows. Mar Savar im Shah Kite Ligmor is Kula Chosel Rosh, U Mar Savar Lamakam Shapasak. Perhaps the Machlokas is based on something that we're going to see later on that if a person creates a pause within his Shemona Esra, for the amount of time that it takes to recite the entire Amida, so then he has to, this is the Machlokas. Do you have to go back and start all over again or not? And perhaps that's the machlokas, is that this fellow may have taken the time to urinate, it may have taken him a long time, and therefore this pause uh, prevented him from resuming Shmon Esrei, and therefore the machlokas is, do you have to start again or not? Amar Ravashi, hai im shoha im lo shoha mi So Ravashi says, if that were the case, then there should have been a conditional statement within this machlokas, and the machlokas should have been predicated upon whether or not there was long enough of a pause during the time that he was urinating. And we don't find that that type of stipulation in the Machlokas. Ella de Kuli Alma im Shaha Kide Ligmar is Kula Chosel Rosh. But rather, says the Gemara, everyone agrees that if the pause that was taken to urinate was the, the, the longer than the amount of time that it takes to finish the entire Amida, then everyone would agree that you'd have to start all over again. The issue over here is, is that the person did not take such a long time. Uh, but he did take a break to urinate. The Mar Savar Gavr Duchu Yehu Vein Roy Vein Tfilaso Tfila. O Mar Savar Gavr Chaz Yehu Tfilaso Tfila. And the Machlokas is simply this. The fact that a guy starts Shemona Esrei having a full bladder to the point where he can't hold it in uh, un- until the end of Shemona Esrei is an indication that even when he started Shemona Esrei, he was a person that was not fit to daven. Because you cannot allow to, you're not fit to daven if you have a full bladder. And as a result, one Mando Amr says that whatever prayers he said during that time, before he urinated, but he had a full bladder, is not considered to be prayer at all, because you have, you have to have a, uh, a, a fit body in order to, to pray. And if you don't have a fit body while you're praying, the tefillah is not a, a valid tefillah. And that's why you have to go all the way back to the beginning. And the other Mando Amr says, no, that even though you had a full bladder, but nevertheless you said the words, and therefore your tefillah b'dievet is kosher, and therefore you can resume where you left off. Tanarabana. Let's go on and see another Bryce. Hanitzrach l'nekava of al Yispalo. That if a person has to defecate, a person has to go for gedolim, or number two as they say, right? Then he should not daven if, if his bowels are full. Ve'im hispalo tefilasatoeva. And if he does so, his prayer is an abomination. And as we learned, an abomination prayer, at least according to some nuschaos that we saw yesterday, is not valid, even b'dieved, and one would have to daven all over again. Amar Rav Zvid v'itema Rav Yehuda lo shanu el asheni yachol lishos ba'atzmo. Aval im yachol lishos ba'atzmo tefilah so tefilah. That's only true that his tefilah is null and void, and it's an abomination if he's not able to hold his bowels. But if he's able to control his bowels and hold it in, so then his prayer is a valid prayer. Vad kama, how long does he have to estimate that he could hold it in for? in order for his Amida to be a kosher Amida. In other words, from the time that he started the Amida, he knew he had full bowels, so it was usher for him to daven. But B'dievet, is his tefillah kosher tefillah? The answer is yes, as long as he could have held it in at that point for a certain period of time. What is that period of time that he could have held it in for? Amar Rav Sheishas Ad Parsa. The amount of time that it takes to walk a Parsa, which the Foskim generally say is about 72 minutes. So if you could hold it in for 72 minutes, then even though it's usher to begin praying, but B'dievet, if you did pray, then B'dievet, the tefillah is a valid tefillah. Some say <coughs> that this discussion of qualifying this uh, tefillah Toeva statement was actually <coughs> qualified by the b'risa itself. That the b'risa itself had said, that the b'risa itself was the one that qualified the statement and said that the only time the prayer is invalid 
is only if you couldn't hold it in. But if you could hold it in, it's a valid tefillah. Biat kama. And how long do you have to be able to hold it in? Uh, on that, Amar Rav Zvid Vitei Rav Yehuda Ad Parsa. That's where the Amoraim uh, states that the time is for the time that it takes to walk a Parsa. Amar Rav Yishmol Bar Nachmeni Amar Rav Yehonasan HaNitzrach L'Nekav Av HaReza Lo Yispaleo that if a person needs to defecate, he's not permitted to pray. Where do we know this from? Mishum Shenamar, as it says in the book of Amos, Hachon likras elokecha Yisrael. Prepare to greet or to call out to your God, O Israel. And therefore you have to prepare your body. Your body cannot have a full bowel or a full bladder in order to be able to pray properly. Va'amar Rabbi Shmuel bar Nachmeni, va'amar Rabbi Yonasan, ma'u dixiv, what is the meaning of the following pasuk? It says in Koheles, Shemor raglacha kasher telech el beso elokim. The first part of the Pasuk says, uh, watch over your feet when you walk to the house of God. So what does that mean, watch over your feet when you walk to the house of God? So we're going to see one interpretation which is not related to our discussion, and then we'll relate it to our discussion. So the first interpretation is, Shemor atzmacha shalotechta. Watch over yourself that you never sin. Because if you do sin, what are you going to have to do? You have to make a trek to Jerusalem to bring a carbon. So better that you never have to trek to Jerusalem to bring a, an atoning carbon. So that's the first part. Watch over yourself to make sure you don't sin. But if you do sin, then have a carbon lefana. Then you should bring a carbon before me, says Hashem. The karov lishmoa. The next part of the pasuk says the karov lishmoa, which literally means that it's nearby to listen. What does that mean? What does that mean? So, Amar Rava, Hevei Karov Lishmoa Divrei Chachamim. That you should be nearby, or you should align yourself to listen to the words of the sages, meaning the practices of the sages. In other words, very wise people, when they do sin, what do they do? She'imchotim eviyim karban va'osim tshuva. That when they sin, they bring a karban and they do tshuva. In other words, if you do sin, then you have to rehabilitate yourself in a wise fashion. That is, bring a carbon, number one, but also make sure that your carbon is accompanied by tshuva in the fashion of the wise people. The next part of the Pasuk says, that do that instead of the giving of the fools when they offer a sacrifice, meaning, and do not be like the fools that when they sin, they bring a carbon, but they don't accompany their carbon with tshuva, with repentance. And the last part of the Pasuk is, because they know not how to do evil. Now that seems to be totally unrelated. What do you mean they know not how to do evil? If so, then don't call them fools or evil people. They're righteous. If a person doesn't know how to do evil, then he's a righteous man. No. Ella, al tihi ka kesilam shechotim uveim karbim veinim yodim im ala toi vehim evim im ala rohim evim. That rather do not be like foolish people, that when they sin, they are instructed, okay, bring a carbon, but they have no idea why they should be bringing a carbon because they don't know the difference between good and bad. In other words, they're just told, okay, re the religion dictates you got to do something. Okay, but they don't even understand that they've done anything wrong because they don't have enough discretion to know the difference between good and evil. So, Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu Bein Tov L'Ra Einon Mavchinam Vehimedim Korban L'Fanai So God retorts and He says, these people don't know the difference between good and evil and yet they have the chutzpah to bring a korban in my, in my temple. The temple's design was only for people who had enough seichel to know when they've done something wrong they can atone. But it doesn't make sense to bring a korban if you don't even know what you've done wrong. Ravashi v'itema Rav Chanina bar Papa Omar shemor nekavecha b'shashat ha'omid b'tfila l'fane. So, up until now we had seen one interpretation of the Pasuk in Koheles. Now the second interpretation, which is related to our issue of going to the bathroom, has to do with this. He says, what does it mean, shemor raglacha kasher telech el beis alakim, watch over your feet? Feet is a euphemism for a person's bodily functions. Right, because that's you know the. You call it your that's why we call it meiraglayim. We urine is called meiraglayim, feet water, literally, right? And uh, very good, Mr. Gruda. And therefore, be watch over your your uh, your orifices when you want to stand in in prayer in front of me. Make sure that you don't have to defecate or relieve yourself or even flatulate, according to Rashi. Tona Rabbanah. 
Hanichnas lebeis hakise cholitz tefilah berichov dalad amos venichnas. Now we see a related Gemara, which has to do with the practice that they used to be in the times of the Talmud. There are two things that are different today than from back then. Number one, they used to wear their tefillin all day, and we only wear our tefillin during davening. Number two, and this is thankfully we live in an advanced technological age, we have indoor plumbing and we have washrooms. Back then, they had latrines. So a latrine was a very stinky, smelly place, which was way out. You needed to go to the bathroom. You might, could, you needed to, you could, in the winter, you'd have to take a, a trek. You'd have to put on your parka and uh, get out there to go to the bathroom. So it was... You remember that, Mr. Gruda, from the good old days. Okay. Uh, uh, <laughs> they weren't so good, right. Um, so therefore, when a person comes to the latrine, he has to remove his tefillin before he gets within a four amma radius of the latrine. And then he can walk in. Now, what are you supposed to do with the tefillin? We're going to learn in just a minute. He says, that's only true if the latrine has already been established and used as a latrine. If, however, you're digging a pit for the first time and you haven't yet used it as a latrine, so then you don't have to remove your tefillin so distant from the latrine. You can remove it immediately before you defecate, and that's fine. But once you've done what you needed to do and then you leave the latrine, since now you've established, you've anointed the latrine and made it into a besakise kavua, made it into a, a permanent smelly latrine, then you can't put your tefillin back on until you distance yourself four amos from it. So now the question is raised. Up until now, we've, talking about, we've been talking about defecation. Is it permitted for a person to walk into a latrine with his tefillin on if he just needs to urinate? Would that be okay? Ravina Shari, but Ravada Barmasna Asa. So the Machlokas, one rabbi said yes, and one rabbi said no. Asu Shailuhu Rava, they went and asked Rava, Amr Luhu Asa. He said it's Asa, why? Because Chayshinan Shema Yifna Bahen. So really his, his logic was, even though technically, since you're not defecating, it's okay to urinate with your tefillin on, at least according to his opinion, but nevertheless the fear is, is that once you're there and you're urinating, you may want to defecate as well and you'll forget that you're wearing your tefillin. The Amri Lashem Yafiyach Bahem. Also, uh, or alternatively, some learned that his response was that you may flatulate while you're urinating and that's problematic because you're not allowed to flatulate with your, uh, with your tefillin on. Tanya Idach. Now we have another b'risa. The b'risa says that if you're approaching a privy, you have to, and it's a already used privy, you have a latrine, you have to remove your tefillin uh, before you get within dalad amos of the latrine, and you have to put your tefillin in a wall, meaning like a, a hole in the wall that is nearby, that is adjacent to a public thoroughfare, meaning as follows. It sounds like from the Bryce that they would be, the, the latrine would be just on the other side of a wall that was abutting a public thoroughfare, which is not uncommon. In other words, they would, they would have a, a public street where people would, would, would pass through, and they would build a wall, and right on the other side of the wall would be, let's say, a public restroom. Okay? So if you're going into that restroom, you've got to first remove your tefillin if, before you get within the four amma radius. And then, when you, you can't walk in, according to this opinion, with the tefillin into the latrine, and what you must do instead is stick it into a wall that's facing the public area, not facing the latrine, out of respect to the tefillin. Now, v'nichnas, and then you can go inside. And then when you get out, when you've done what you needed to do, you come out, and again, you have to distance for Amos before putting your tefillin back on. This is all according to Beis Shammai, who's very machmir about not mistreating your tefillin and making sure that your tefillin always stay at a distance from the latrine. U Beisilol omrim ochasan biyado v'nichnas, and Beisilol disagree. Basilo say that no, you can even actually hold the tefillin and walk into the, the latrine with your, with your tefillin in your hand. Rabbi Akiva Omer, Ochsan Bevigdo Vinichnas. Rabbi Akiva says you can hold them only with your garments. So the Gemara says, Bevigdo Salkadaitach Zimen Mishtalilu Vinafli. 
How can you hold something in your garment? Remember, those days they didn't have big pockets like we have today. So the thinking was you're going to manage to somehow wrap it in a, in a hem of your garment, but it could slip out and fall to the ground. That's not a good solution. But rather, says Rabbi Akiva, what he means is, is that you can wrap it in a, a corner of your garment and then hold the wrapped tefillin in your hand, and that way you can walk into the latrine. Alternatively, Rabbi Akiva advocates that if you want to put it in a hole that's adjacent to the latrine, that's fine, like a hole in the wall, uh, like a cubby in the wall, that's fine, but you don't have to put it on the side of the public thoroughfare, you can put it on the side of the wall that's facing the latrine. What do you do today when you're in the air party? Uh, one second, one second. It's, uh, I just want to finish the thought, and then we'll talk about ha practical halacha. Do not put it in a hole that is adjacent to the public area on the other side of the wall, but rather you should place it on the part of the wall that's on the inside facing the latrine. And the reason is, The reason is, is because someone who's traveling may abscond your tefillin, may walk yeah. off with your yeah. tefillin, and you'll come to fall under suspicion. Now what kind of suspicion? Uh, you should be upset that you're, someone walked off with your tefillin. What suspicion are we talking about? So the Gemara explains, Once a yeshiva bachar stuck his tefillin in a hole in the wall on the public thoroughfare side and then walked into the latrine. A prostitute came along and stole his tefillin. Right? She figured, black market, right? Then she comes to the base medrash. And she said, look at what this yeshiva bachar gave me as wages for my services. He's going to blackmail him. So Kevin Shishama Oso, Talmud Kach, Allah Larosha, Gag Venafal Vemes. The student here is this. He is so distraught that his reputation has been ruined that he committed suicide by jumping off a roof. And from then on, they decreed that either you put it, you wrap it in your garment and hold it in your hand and go in and uh, it seems like that's the only thing that they said to do. In other words, from that point onwards, they said that's all you need to do. You don't even need to stick it in a hole in the wall. You can take it, with, it, it in with you into the latrine itself. Now, <clears throat> Uh, just only a public service announcement. A fellow came over to me just coincidentally last night and said that he left his tefillin bag with his astalis and tefillin bag in, our, in the Turk base medrash and <coughs> someone walked off with his tefillin. He left for a couple of hours, came back, and his tefillin was gone. Not only, well, not only was his tefillin gone, he figured, okay, maybe that someone put it away. His talus was still there. The talus and the talus bag was still there. Someone opened up the talus bag and took out the tefillin and walked off with it. So obviously we're dealing with a mentally ill person because only mentally ill people would steal tefillin, mm -hmm. right? To admit, uh, what kind of person wants to do a mitzvah, mm -hmm. right? By stealing something. But, it, but number yeah. one, yeah. cautionary tale that what you should do is make sure you don't leave your tefillin out in the open. And uh, let's hope that uh, the story that we just read doesn't happen to that poor guy. Anyway. So, so you're in the Air Force, so what you should do is double bag your right? Well, the, the post can talk about double wrapping the tefillin as a way to um, obviate the problem of exposing the tefillin to any uh, for, forbidden environment. So the Gemara over here is more permissive than the post can themselves say you can be with the tefillin. With tefillin today, as long as they're double wrapped in their own bag plus a plastic outside of that, so then, or, and according to some, you have to put an additional wrap around that, then you'd be allowed to, in a situation where you can't <coughs> keep them outside the airport, you'd allow to bring them into, the, uh, into the, the bathroom with you. Also, you have to realize that our bathrooms today, because we flush everything out, may not be as problematic as the latrines in the times of the Gemara, but we don't have time to discuss that. Originally, the original decree was that you can't walk in with the tefillin into the latrine, but rather you should put it in a hole, even according to Beis Hillel, put it in a hole on the side that's facing the latrine. But the problem was is that even though, um, even though there were no people there, but mice would come along and they would damage or walk off with the tefillin. They must have been really big mice or rats. Then they changed the policy and said, okay, put it on the side of the wall that's facing the public thoroughfare. 
and not linosan. And then the two two legged vermin went ahead and, and took them away and they were stealing them. So therefore he skinu And therefore the rabbis decreed that a person should take it in his hand and walk into the latrine itself for the sake of the preservation of the tefillin. I'm a Rebbe Miyasha, Bered Rebbe Yeshua ben Levi. Halacha gololan kemin sefer va'ochsan b'yaminu keneged libo. The halacha is that in order to preserve the tefillin, but to treat them with respect, you have to wrap them properly like a, like a scroll, meaning to take, make sure that all the ritzuos are wrapped around the bottom of the tefillin, and then hold them in your right hand and lift them up to where your chest is by your heart. I'm assuming the reason to hold them in your right hand is because you're going to be wiping with your left and you don't want to get the two hands confused. Amar of Yosef bar Minyumi, Amar of Nachman of Ulvad Shalotehi Ritzua Yotzeis Mitachas Yado Tefach. They have to be wrapped so well that there cannot be any dangling strap of leather m- more than a tefach of length. Amar of Yaakov bar Acha, Amar of Zera, Loshanu Elishi Shahus Biyom Lalabshan. Aval Ein Shahus Biyom Lalabshan, Osalahen Kimin Kis Tefach Umenicha. He says this halacha, that you can walk in with your tefillin in your hand, is only true if there's enough time in the day after you relieve yourself to put your tefillin back on. In which case, the rabbi said, in order to preserve the tefillin, you can hold them in your hand and then put them right back on. But if you're going to the bathroom, if you're going to the latrine, and it's almost the end of the day, so that by the time you finish relieving yourself, it's going to to be too late, it's already going to be shkia, so then, no, then you should put them in their proper tefillin bag when you take them off, then you can keep them with you, but make sure that the tefillin bag has at least one tefach of air space to act as a buffer from the outside world. And then you can even put them on the ground. It's mashma from Rashi. Amar Rabba Bar Barchana, Amar Rabbi Yechanan, Biyom Gololan Kimin Sefer, Umenichin Biyado Keneged Libo, a similar principle that during the daytime you should wrap them like a scroll and then hold them in your right hand by your chest. Uvalayla Oselahen Kimin Kis Tefach Umenichin. And at night, since you're not putting on the tefillin anymore, you should put them, roll them up and, uh, and, uh, and, and put them in their bag, and then you can even leave them on the ground. That's only true that we require the bag to have a, a tefach of airspace, only, be, only when the bag is designated as the tefillin bag. And the reason for that is, is because since it's a designated tefillin bag, it's, it, it, it is um, considered to be totally ancillary and, and tafel to the tefillin itself. And therefore, in order to create a buffer between the tefillin and the outside environment, there has to be a tefach of airspace within the bag. But if, the tfil, if this bag is not the designated tefillin bag, so then it's not totally ancillary to the tefillin, and therefore the bag is sufficient even if it doesn't have a tefach of airspace. Amar Marzutra Vitema Ravashi, Teda Shahri Pacham Ketana Matsilin Ba'ol Ames. To prove or illustrate this point, we know that if you have a small container, and the small container is double sealed, and it is inside a, an enclosure where there's a corpse, then the contents of that small container do not contract tuma, even though they're inside the same enclosure. Why? Because they're, they're protected by the vessel. I, even though the vessel does not have a tefach of airspace inside of it, but nevertheless, that since the vessel is not considered to be completely ancillary to its contents, it protects the contents, and the same thing would be true by a, t- a bag that is not the designated fill-in bag. That we once were following Rabbi Yochanan, and he needed to relieve himself, he needed to go to the latrine. So when he would be holding a scroll of Torah teachings, and it's not clear what Agadita here means, but there were certain scrolls of abbreviated texts, when he would be holding one of those scrolls, he would give it to us to hold it before going into the latrine. But when he was holding his tefillin, he would actually walk into the tefillin, even though he had the option of giving it to us, he preferred to walk into the latrine with them. Why? Because Amar Hol Visharuhu Rabbanan Ninatran. He says, listen, since permission has been granted by the Chachamim <coughs> to walk into a latrine with your tefillin, even though I have another option, but I might as well use the protective benefits of the tefillin to protect me from the evil spirits that dwell around latrines. And as we'll learn later on, that a latrine is considered to be a spiritually dangerous place because shadim typically linger by foul places. 
And since the latrine is a foul-smelling place, shadim are found to be there. And therefore, if you have the uh, 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 ability to protect yourself through the kedusha of the tefillin, so he said, I might as well do that. Amarava ki hava azlinon basrei de Rav Nachman ki hava nakit sir for the agada to Yahivlan ki hava nakit fillin lo Yahivlan. Amar hold b'sharunu Rabban and Anatran. The Gemara just illustrates another story with a later sage that held the same thing as Rav Yochanan. Tanu Rabban lo Yochez Adam tefillin biyad of a sefer Torah b'zro v'ispal. Now we have another halacha not related to uh, relieving oneself, but having to do with holding something in your hands during prayer. During prayer, a person has to be able to clear his environment of any distractions and therefore shouldn't have anything that he's holding in his hands that would distract him from his prayers. And therefore, a person should not be holding tefillin in his hand. He should not be holding a Torah scroll in his, in his, uh, in his arms and, and be davening Shemon Esrei that way because he's going to be distracted by, the, by thinking, I better make sure I don't drop this. And therefore, it takes a little bit away from his ability to have kavana, and therefore it's asr. Aye, what about the fact that we hold sidurim when we daven? The answer is, is if it's for the purpose of prayer, because you need to see the words of the tefillah, that's okay, but only a sitter, but not another sefer, not anything else. It's a valid, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a valid argument. You know, what are they supposed to do during that time? I, I believe that this is only during Shmon Esri itself, but during other prayers, mm -hmm. the, the requirement of this level of kavana is not to that extent. It's a good, it's a good point. Velo yashtin bahen mayim. Furthermore, a person may not urinate while he's wearing his tefillin or holding a sefer Torah. Velo yishan bahen lo shinas keva velo shinas arai. Nor, when a person's wearing his tefillin, may he sleep at all, even a cat nap. And the reason is, is that uh, since a person's not allowed to flatulate with his tefillin, when you fall asleep, you're not in control of your body. And so you may end up flatulating in your sleep, and therefore you can't sleep at all. <coughs> Omar Shmuel. So Shmuel says, Sakin umos, Examples of things that are going to distract you if you're holding them during Shmona Esrei are a knife, money, a, 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 a tray or a plate, and a loaf of bread. All of these things have the same halacha as a Sefer Torah, a pair of tefillin. You can't be holding these things while you're davening. So a baby, you shouldn't be holding uh, it. <coughs> you shouldn't be holding a baby, although the post can talk about that. If you need to hold the baby in order to shush him because you're in a public situation, so that takes priority over the issue of kavana. It's a good point. Amar Rava, Amar Rav Sheishas, Les Hilchasa Ki Hamas Nisa, Debe Shamahi. So Rava makes a very interesting statement. He says, in the name of Rav Sheishas, he says, this brisa is not according to the halacha because this brisa must go according to Be Shamai. What's my proof? He said, because according to Beis Hillel, you're allowed to even walk into a, a Beis HaKisei Kavua, an already used latrine, with your tefillin in your hand. So surely, and part of this Brisa had said, that what? That you're not allowed to urinate while you're holding your tefillin. So, and that's only a Beis HaKisei Arai. That's only in a in a non, that, that could be even in a non-fixed latrine because when you need to urinate, you don't have to go out all the way to the field to go to the deep hole latrine. You could just have some, some small area, which is a, a non-stinky latrine. And so why shouldn't Basil allow you to go into that kind of area and urinate while you're holding your tefillin? So therefore, the fact that th it's prohibited in this brisa indicates that it goes according to Beishamai, not according to Basil. And therefore, we don't paskin like this brisa. So the Gemara says, Mace, let me challenge what you just said. That the Brysa <coughs> commenting on itself says, in relation to this Brysa, that which I have permitted for you here, I have forbidden for you elsewhere. So my love, so what does that mean? It must be referring to the law of tefillin and talking about holding on to the tefillin when you're going into a privy or a latrine. So Iyamart Bishlama Basil Hitarti Lucha Khan Kavua Sarti Lucha Khan Ba Besaki say Arai. If you tell me that the Brisa goes according to Bas Hillel, then it makes good sense. That even though Bas Hillel uh, permitted me to go into a permanent latrine or a fixed latrine, yet still here they forbid me from urinating uh, in a temporary latrine while I'm holding my fill. Then it would make sense. Ela Iyamart Beshamai Halo Sharu Velomidi. 
But if you're going to tell me that this brisa goes according to Beis Shammai, then how could the brisa say, even though I've permitted it for you elsewhere, I prohibit it for you here? Where does Beis Shammai ever permit? And therefore, this is an indication that this can't go according like to, be, to Beis Shammai. So Kitanya, so the Gemara wants to answer, uh, no, what, what that statement of, even though I've permitted it for you elsewhere, I, pro- I prohibit it for you here, is not referring to urinating while you're holding your tefillin, but rather, Kitanya hi, le'inyan tefach utfachayim. That there is also in relation to this brisa, there's a halacha describing how much of a person's body is allowed to be revealed for tzniyas purposes while he's relieving himself. The tani chada kishu nifna megala la'achar of tefach ulafan of tefachayim, because one brisa in that same set of brisa says that when a person relieves himself, he is allowed to reveal only on his backside one tefach, and on his front side he can expose two tefachs. But another Brysa says, that on his backside he reveals only a tefach of his body, and in his front, his front side he cannot re- expose himself at all. So my love, idi v'idi v'ish v'lokasha. So the Gemara's assumption is that these two Brysas are not in contradiction. They're both talking about a man relieving himself. And there's no contradiction because kan l'gdoilim kan l'kitanim. That <coughs> when it comes to relieving yourself for... Um, for feces, so then you're allowed to expose yourself <coughs> both in the front, uh, uh, only only in the only on the back side, but not in the front side. But when you want to urinate, then you can expose yourself even in the front side as well, and you expose yourself to tefachs. So the Gemara says the tispera. Does that make any sense? That ifiketanim laachar of tefach lomeli. If we're talking, if with the brisa that says you can expose yourself on your front side to tefachs is when you want to urinate, then why does it give you permission to expose, expose yourself on the back side at all, if you're not defecating? So, ela ida v'ida b'gedolim v'lo kasha. So, rather, that's not the interpretation. The interpretation is that both brises are talking about when you want to defecate. The ha'be'ish, ha'be'isha. But one brise is talking about a man defecating, in which case there's always the possibility that he'll urinate concomitantly with his defecation, and therefore he can expose both his front side and his back side, his ba- back side only one tefach and his front side two tefachim, to allow room for the, uh, for the liquid to come out. And a woman who doesn't typically urinate while she's defecating or will not, does not need the front side to be open has to leave her frontal part of her clothing still intact and can only um, expose her, the back side of her garment in order to defecate. So Ihachi, so the Gemara says, well, if that's so, Ha Diketani, Allah, Zehu Kalvachomer, Shenelav Tshuva. But then the Brisa also makes a statement saying that this defies logic. In other words, even though the Brisa had said, I have forbidden it for you elsewhere, but I permit it for you here, in relation to this, you're saying that this is in relation to the statement of, are you allowed to expose yourself on your front side when, 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 uh, when, when defecating? So, you're, and then the Brisa says, but this defies logic. It goes against the Kal V'chomer. So the Gemara says, that makes no sense now. My ain't a love tshuva, darcha de milsa hachi isa. You've explained it quite logically, and if you're telling me that it has to do with bodily functions, uh, and uh, in relation to the exposure and the difference between the method of defecation for males and females, then it makes very good sense the way you've explained it. So why does the Brisa have to say that it defies logic? El alav tefillin utiyufta de rava amar avsheshes tiyufta. So the Gemara's conclusion is that, no, we have to stick with our original interpretation. The Brisa that says, even though I've permitted it for you in a, in a Beisa Kise Kavua, even though I've permitted it for you in a, in a fixed latrine, I have prohibited you from urinating in a temporary latrine, is referring to the, while, you, while you're holding your tefillin. And it is a refutation of Rav in the name of Rav Sheish, who says this is not according to Halacha, but goes according to it goes according to Beis Shammai. Really, in reality, it goes according to Beis Hila. And we do paskin like this. But now we're still faced with the problem of Mikol Makom Kasha, right? But the, still, the question is, why then is it that in a permanent latrine, you're allowed to walk in with a tefillin, whereas in a non-permanent latrine, when you just need to urinate, you're not allowed to urinate while holding the tefillin in your hand. Why should that be? Hashta Beis Akisei Kavua Shari Beis Akisei Arai Lo Surely it should be permitted if you're going to a, not, a latrine which is not so foul and stinky. So, so what the, rather the Gemara says, the way you understand it is as follows. 
Beis Akisei Kavua Deleka Nitzotzos Shari, Beis Akisei Arai Deika Nitzotzos Asri. Answers the Gemara as follows. When you walk into a fixed latrine, you know why it's okay? You're, you're, you're even allowed to urinate with your tefillin in hand. You know why? Because, or at least <coughs> the Gemara is entertaining that you're allowed to do that, and that is because when you go to a fixed latrine, the, the, the pit is deep, and there's not going to be what we call nitsotsos, which is splashed droplets of urine all over the place. When you go to a temporary latrine, where there's no real toilet <coughs> hole for you to, for you to uh, urinate in, but maybe you'll be urinating against the wall or on the ground or something like that, then what happens is the result is there are splashes of urine that fall all over the place, including on your shoes. Now, Chazal, as we'll see later on in more detail, made a takana, that if a person urinates, and he ends up with little droplets of urine on his feet or on his shoes, he's mechuyev to wipe them off before he exits the latrine, before he comes out to the public. Now, why is that? The reason is, is because if people think that you urinated on your, on your shoes, then maybe they would be of the opinion that either you had a bad moil, like the old joke goes, <laughs> or that physiologically there's something wrong so that your, the, the flow of urine does not shoot out straight, but rather shoots downwards. Now, why is that problematic? Who cares? There's, by the way, there's a condition called hypostadius, which is exactly that where the meatus of the penis is on the shaft and it's not at the tip of the penis. Why is that problematic? The reason it's problematic is because such a person cannot impregnate a woman because the, the seminal flow is the same, comes out of the same hole as the urine flow. And as a result, you can't get a woman pregnant if the, if the, uh, uh, if the zera does not come out straight. And if so, if this guy has kids and he's got droplets of urine on his feet, people are going to say his kids are mamzerim. His kids are not really his. They must be from another father. And his wife committed adultery. So to avoid that whole accusatory line of thinking, Chazal required you to wipe your feet, wipe your shoes, before you come out of the, out of the privy. Now, so what is the problem? What does that have to do with tefillin? Because if you're holding tefillin in your hand, and now you've got to wipe your shoes, you may be tempted to use the ritzuas of your tefillin as a wipe. So therefore, Chazal said, don't, <coughs> don't walk in with tefillin if you're going to be urinating in a latrine where there's going to be splashing, because then your the tefillin is going to be compromised. So, if that's the case, then why is there, why is this defy, uh, why is this defy logic? There's why did you say that there's no way to explain it properly? So Hachi Kamar, Hamilsa Tesi La Bitaras Taima Velotesi La Bikalvachomer. The Yasi La Bitaras Kalvachomer is that Kalvachomer Shaino Lov Chuva. The answer explains the Gemara. It doesn't mean that I can't explain it to you. I can explain to you um, uh, conceptually or logistically as to why it's prohibited to urinate in a temporary latrine versus a permanent latrine based upon the droplets of splashed urine. However, if you were going to use pure logic without knowing the logistics of the latrines, but based upon the <coughs> fact that a beisakise kavua, that a fixed latrine is more foul and is more offensive to the tefillin than a temporary latrine, then I wouldn't be able to explain it to you. That's what the b'risa means, she'ena love tshuva. It's a kalvachomer, it's a logical argument just based upon the offensiveness of a temporary latrine versus a permanent latrine mm -hmm. that really defies logic. But when you think about the logistics of a, um, of a temporary latrine, then Itaka makes a lot of sense. Tana Rabbon. Harotz likanes lasudas keva mahale chasar pomim dalat amos o dalat pomim yud amos v'yifna v'yachar kach nichnas. Now we're talking about, again, defecation, but we're talking about in the context of being invited to someone's home for a meal. You get invited to a meal, and you sort of, so sort of feel that my bowels are a little bit filled. So you want to make sure that you don't have the embarrassing situation of having to excuse yourself in the middle of the meal. It's not only embarrassing, but it's, it's unseemly as well to defecate in the middle of the meal. So therefore, what you should do is you should walk for 40 amos. Either take 10 uh, groups of 4 amos walk or 4 groupings of a 10 amos walk because walking helps activate your bowels and this is in the hopes that you'll, be re you'll relieve yourself before you actually begin the meal. Furthermore, Rabbi Yitzchak says that when you're, you come into a, someone's home for a meal, you should, you're, you're walking around with your tefillin all day, as we mentioned before. You should take off your tefillin before you begin the meal, 
uh, and before you enter into the room where they're eating, and then you come into the room without your tefillin on. Upliga the Rebchia, but this disagrees with Rebchia. The Amar Rebchia menichan al shulchano bechein hadrula. He says that no, come into the room, into the dining room where the where the meal is taking place, and take off your tefillin right there and leave them on the table. That's considered to be your glory, right? It's a, it's it's honorable for you to have your tefillin next to you while you're dining. Biad emas, and how long or how long must your tefillin remain off while you're dining? Amar of Nachman bar Yitzchak adzman brach until it's time to bench. Then you put your tefillin on and then you bench with your tefillin. Tani chad atzor adam tefila v'maosa v'arfika suso v'tani idach lo yatsa. We have two brises that seem to be in contradiction. One says that you're allowed to wrap your tefillin and keep them in a kerchief or a bag together with your cash, with your money. And another brises says that you're not allowed to do that. So what's the reconciliation? Lo kasha hada azmane hada lo azmane. One is where you, the bag has been designated as a tefillin bag in which case you cannot keep anything in that bag because of its kedusha other than the tefillin. And the other case is where you put it in some kind of just uh, any shopping bag, which has not been designated as a tefillin bag, then you can put other things in there as well. The Amar of Chizda, as Reb Chizda had taught, Hai sudu the tefillin, the azimne lameitzer but tefillin, that if you have a kerchief or a bag that you've designated as a tefillin bag, sar be tefillin also lameitzer be pshiti. If you've already stored your tefillin in there, then you're not allowed to store money as well. Asmane velo tsar be tsar be velo asmane. But if you've just designated it, but you haven't yet stored tefillin in there, or if you've stored tefillin in there, but you did not designate it as a tefillin bag, then shari lameit tsar be zuzay. Then you're allowed to store cash together with the tefillin in that bag. That's so probably why they stole the, the tefillin, because they figured it might be a tefillin. Right. A, a Who knows? Bag. According to him, though, you need to have both. You needed to have it both be designated as a tefillin bag and to be used as a tefillin bag. So should we we'll put tefillin on here as well as dollars? No, so, so that's a good point. Well, Abaya de Omar has mana milsahi, asmane apagav de lo tsarve. So, according to Abaya, who says that designation itself changes something's halachic status, then even if you just designate it as a tefillin bag, even if you'd never yet used it as a tefillin bag, that already precludes it from being used for, for storage of anything else, including your coins. Sarve i asmane asr ilo asmane lo. And, uh, and consistent with that, if you use it without having designated it as a tefillin bag, but you just used it to store your tefillin, you can still store your cash in it. But if you used it and you designated it, so then, um, so then it's, uh, it's problematic. Oh, so, so going to your issue, I just wanted to point out that um, people sometimes make a mistake and they store other pe- things in their tefillin bag, like a sitter or like a mirror. You're not supposed to keep those in your tefillin bag. The tefillin bag is only for your tefillin. The plastic that's on the outside of the tefillin bag right. is the appropriate place for you to keep your mirror and your sitter and your tchinas and you know, all of the other things that you want to keep together with your with your with your tefillin. So ba minei Rav Yosef bereider Rav Nechunim me Rav Yehuda. Mahu shianiach adam tefilah tachas mira ashosa. What's the halacha? Should a, is a person allowed to store? his tefillin underneath his head when he goes to bed at night. In other words, you want to protect your tefillin at night. You want to protect it from ganavim and from mice or whatever else is going to be in the house. So you want to know, can I sleep with my tefillin under my head when I go to bed? So tachas margelosev lo komibaya li shenoik behen minig vizayev. I'm not, it goes without saying that I know that I can't keep it under my feet at night. That because that would be the desecration of the tefillin. My, my question is, what about keeping it under your head? Shmuel says that not only is it permitted, but it's permitted even if a person's in bed with his wife and he's going to have intimacy with his wife, it's permitted to keep your tefillin under your head. So we challenge that. It says in the Brice, the Brice says you can't store your tefillin by your feet at night because that's desecration. But you could put it underneath your head. However, but if your wife is with you in bed, then you cannot put it under your head. But if there's a place like a cubby above three tefachim above your bed or below three tefachim below your bed, so then you could store it there. So what do we see? To yufta de shmuel to yufta. This is a refutation of shmuel because you see quite clearly in the brisa that it's only permitted when your wife is not with you. But if your wife is with you, then it's not. Then it, then it's forbidden. 
Omar Rava, so Rava says on that, Afal Gav, the Tanya to Yuf to the Shmuel, Hilchasuk Very strange statement. Even though we've refuted Shmuel from a Brisa, we nevertheless must conclude that he is correct as far as a practical knowing what to do with your tefillin. Why? My taima, kolin in Turin, hu adif. Because the more that you can protect your tefillin, the better. And since there's such a danger of having the tefillin compromised or damaged or stolen in some way, then even though, yes, it's true, you're, uh, you're possibly desecrating the environment of the tefillin by having them under your head while you're with your wife in bed, nevertheless, it's, that's the better of the two evils because if not, you may end up getting them damaged or stolen and that would be a, uh, that would be a terrible thing. The Gemara says, and where do you keep the tefillin when they're underneath your head? Where, how do you position it? You should put it between the mattress and the pillow, and it should not be directly underneath your head, but rather to the side of your head. And the Gemara is going to discuss this further, Mitzvah Shem, tomorrow. Have a wonderful day and a great Shabbos.